So it's a privilege and honor to introduce an up and coming neurotologist, one of our current fellows, Dr. Helena Vukova, who's going to speak on cochlear implants, past to present. So we're looking forward to this talk. So thanks for putting this together. Dr. Slattery, um, I'm going to turn my video off here. Sometimes my internet's a little spotty, so I want to make sure I don't lose you guys. But um, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys today. And as Dr. Slattery mentioned, I'll be talking about cochlear implants past to present. I, oh, let me see. There we go. I have no disclosures. And I know that this is a very broad topic and I think we could spend a couple hours today talking about cochlear implants in general. So since I have just an hour to talk to you guys, I set out a couple objectives for one, us. So one, we're gonna review the history and needs for initial success of cochlear implants. Two, we're gonna talk about the current criteria for implantation. And then three, I'll present the current data set from House Clinic, which actually Dr. Mills was one of the ones who helped me put this together. So thank you, Rahat. Um, for us to understand why cochlear implants are so important, I think it's important to actually know some of the st statistics and realize how prevalent hearing loss is. So more than 360 million people worldwide have disabling hearing loss. That ends up translating to more than 40 million people in the United States alone. When we take a look at the map here below, pretty much one in three of patients older than 60 will experience some degree of hearing loss, and one in six in the baby boomer population, so 41 to 59, also have hearing loss. So these numbers are pretty staggering. We know that hearing loss results in social isolation, depression, and accelerated cognitive decline. Despite these correlation and despite these large numbers, less than 10% of adult CI candidates undergo surgery in the United States. And some of these, or some of the reasons for this are insurance, some of them is lack of access, and some of them are just lack of awareness. So hopefully that's a number we can work on and improve in the future. And I think for us to be able to do that, we have to understand where cochlear implants came from and what can we do with them now. So let's take a brief history lesson. And I know we have Dr. House here online and he could give us a much more detailed history, but these are some of the um, dates that I wanted to point out and then we'll go into a little more detail, but pretty much electrical stimulation of the cochlea or of the ear goes as far back as the 1800s. The first reported person to use electrical stimulation is Alessandro Volta, who pretty much was deaf. He tried to put an electrode straight through his ear and listen for some sound. Apparently, he was able to hear some or have sound awareness, but that being said, that really didn't go anywhere. It wasn't really until the 1980s where the cochlear implant came to the scene. So in 1984, the first single channel CI was approved by FDA, and this was Dr. House's creation. Then in 1987, a multi-electrode implant was approved for adults, and then it wasn't until 1990 where the CI was approved for children as well. Um, clearly, the story is much more complicated than just looking at the approval dates of 84 and 87. So this is from an audiology article, which was in the White Journal, which I think did an excellent of reviewing cochlear implant history. And here we see the timeline clearly goes much further back. So here we again see in the 1800s, Volta trying to um, stimulate his own ear. But I think where the numbers actually were, um, where this starts to get interesting is in 1905, when Potter uh, tried to have a patent for mastoid electrical stimulators. And then in 1940s, Stevens and Lurie uh, did possible direct electrical stimulation of the inner ear with an electrode that was placed in the middle ear during ear surgery. Then in 1950s, uh, Lundberg's tried sinusoidal current perceived as sound. This was done by direct stimulation of the auditory nerve during neurosurgery. And now we kind of start where cochlear implants come into play and when we see electrode stimulation near cranial nerve eight. So again, we see Dr. House and Doyle's with some of their single channel electrodes in 61. 
uh, then House and Urban in 69, uh, looking at three implants for single channel electrodes. And then Dr. Clark started doing some of his studies with specifically cats. And then we started looking at implants of some of the um, multi-channel electrodes. I think the important date here as well um, before cochlear implants were approved is the first international conference on cochlear implants, which was in 1973. Uh, the picture here we have on the right is actually one from this article as well. And um, the specimen is now in Vienna, but it's the world's first microelectronic multi-channel cochlear implant. So clearly we've come a long way, but this is kind of what we started with. Similarly, uh, these are some of the images from um, the House Ear Clinic looking at an example of the cochlear implant system back in 1982. And actually, this is an example of a prototype of one of the single channel arrays from House Clinic as well. So this might be a bit of a review, but for the fellows on the call here, I just very briefly wanted to go through all the cochlear implant components. And as we see on the picture on the left, these have evolved over time, but essentially, the main parts have remained the same. So there is an external component and then there is an internal component. For the external component, we have the microphone, we have the transmitter, the external magnet, and the speech processor. The speech processor is kind of the mastermind which decompresses the audio signal and sends it into the internal component. So on the inside, we have the receiving antenna, the internal magnet, the receiver itself, which uh, gets the decompressed audio Audio signals and then sends this to the electrode array, which is what stimulates um, the inner ear and eventually results in sound perception for the patient. This quote down here is from Audiology and Neuroautology, and I think it puts into perspective kind of the initial goals for cochlear implantation. So speech perception goals for the earlier cochlear implant patients were modest. That is, open set speech recognition was not anticipated for the vast majority of implant users. Essentially, if patients got sound awareness, it was considered a success. So for cochlear implants initially to even undergo FDA approval and for us to ensure that they were safe for patients, we had to make sure that they would not cause damage to the inner ear. So um, in order to um, do some of these studies, Dr. Clark et al. looked at various animal models. And the uh, slide that I want to present to you here is actually from a cat model. So they looked at what chronic electrical stimulation by a cochlear implant would do to spiral ganglion neurons. So they took a litter of kittens, which were deafened soon after birth, and they were implanted on one side while they were deaf on the other ear. Um, and then, you know, they were followed for a period of months, and then they looked at the histology slide, which we see down here at the bottom left, um, um, the panel that's labeled G is the spiral ganglion that has had the cochlear implant in it. And about 50% of the spiral ganglion cells were present in this chronically stimulated ear versus um, panel H is the one that was the deafened side without any stimulation. And only 30% of the spiral ganglion cells survived. So we do see that chronic electrical stimulation actually promoted inner ear survival, which is very good news for our cochlear implant users. On the graph labeled A here, we kind of see that the same trend was uh, preserved along the whole distance from cochlear base. So pretty much along the whole length of the cochlear duct, we did see a higher survival of cells within the Rosenthal canal in the stimulated side as compared to the controlled side. So some of these animal studies showed us that cochlear implants are not gonna damage the inner ear, if anything, will help some of the cells that are needed for hearing perception to survive. Next thing was actually making sure that the device would stay in the human body without significant infection or reaction from the body. So partly when you take a look at the timeline, a lot of the studies came in 1940s and onward. And part of this is because on the periodic perioperative antibiotics became popular during this time frame. 1940s to 1962 is where 
most of the modern classes of antibiotics were introduced. And in addition to that, uh, we came up with techniques that would help us block off the inner ear and potentially prevent spread of infection. So use of a muscle autograph uh, decreased the risk of post-operative labyrinthitis by 95%. This is a very neat histo slide looking from an old implant patient. And essentially here on the left, we see the inner ear. On the right, we see the middle ear and we see the nice fibrous sheath that has formed along the electrode. And on the right, we can actually see that there was a middle ear infection with quite a few inflammatory cells. But due to that fibrous capsule, this didn't spread into the inner ear and cause labyrinthitis. So that being said, we now had an implant that could safely go into the human body. So the next question was, how do we code for sound or how do we translate electrical signals to understandable sounds to the patient? And this is where the discussion of single channel versus multi-channel implants comes into play. So if you recall what the picture here on the left reminds us is the phonotopical distribution of the cochlea. We see at the base, the high frequencies and at the apex, the low frequencies. So essentially single channel implants were only able to convey the amplitude of speech, but they could not code for different frequencies. This is in contrast with multi-plans, which could code for different frequencies and loudness as they stimulated different parts of the cochlea. So now all of the modern day cochlear implants use multi-channel uh, technology. And we do know that CIs now divide the sound into channels, and this eventually is what's used to drive electrodes. So after having an electrode that we know could successfully stimulate the cochlea having a way to keep the implant in without causing significant reaction from the body. The question was how to best deliver the device to the area. And specifically, we want to make sure that the cochlear implant goes into the scala tympani. Um, and we see that here in some of the graphs. Uh, we see that the scala tympani is immediately medial to the round window. So um, this is a discussion that is ongoing, and I would say that we still don't have a full consensus on insertion, but the two main techniques now are cochleostomy versus round window insertion. So at the bottom here, we just have a quick anatomical review. This is a cadaveric specimen. We see that the mastoid has been drilled out. We see the antrum, the incus, and we see a standard um, facial recess approach where here they point out to us where the oval window is in relationship to the round window niche with the round window being underneath versus where the cochleostomy side would go. So um, different studies have slightly different outcomes for this, but most of them uh, have agreed upon that cochleostomy insertion causes higher immediate trauma to the intercochlear structures. This is due to the high speed drilling on the cochlea itself. And due to this uh, increased trauma with the cochleostomy, there's a potential for increased osteoneogenesis with cochleostomies, which can cause delayed high drops. There's been several um, histological studies that show increased inflammation and potentially new bony growth along the cochleostomy site, forming delayed high drops and dilation, which in some of these patients who initially have hearing preservation, you can see delayed drops. That being said, there is improved hearing preservation with round window insertion, and a lot of that is due to what we've just discussed above. And in some of the studies, there's improved postoperative speech perception scores with round window insertion, but I'd like to go into a little more detail with that. Um, there was a recent meta-analysis that was published in Otology and Neurotology by Snells et al who looked at 26 articles looking at different techniques and hearing preservation in cochlear implants. And out of this, one of the factors that they looked at was actually cochleostomy versus round window insertion. And um, when they looked at the mean difference in hearing preservation outcomes between cochleostomy and round window approach, in favor of round window approach, they found difference in hearing preservation of 13% at one month 18.6% at six months, but this difference closed at 
12 months with only 1.7% difference. So the only number out of these three that was statistically significant was the one at six months. And we see that here at the graph too, where we see um, higher performance with the round window insertion at six months, but this gap closes at 12 months. So I think the takeaway point from this is, you know, I think the approach needs to be individualized for the patient. And I think both of them are good techniques to know and whichever one the surgeon is most comfortable with, which they know gives them good results is the one that should be used consistently. That being said, um, as the devices have undergone development, there is a multitude of different widths and lengths of electrodes. There are different stylets and um, guidance, guided insertions. We do know that some of the complications or poor performance can result with um, issues with the insertion itself. These usually include incomplete insertion, kinking, tip fold over, scalar translocation, or electrode migration. Here in the x-ray above, we see again, they point to us that the location where we want to insert is the scala tympani. We see the basement membrane labeled too, and in the higher apical turns, we actually see translocation to scala vestibuli. So again, that's going to give us poor results. So um, for the fellows here, just a quick review of lateral wall versus perimedialar. And a lot of this has to do with different stylets based on the manufacturer. But I think uh, this diagram on the left does a very great job of summarizing kind of the di main differences between perimedialar and lateral wall insertion. So on the left, we have a perimedialar electrode. So we see that this is immediately adjacent to the medallis. It's right next to our spiral ganglion cells, which, which it stimulates. And so there's no spread of excitation. So it can be more directed versus the lateral wall here, which is on the right. Um, we see that this pretty much follows the curve of the cochlear duct. So with that being said, there's a slightly larger distance between the spiral ganglion cells and there can be a higher spread of excitation. So, um, some of the data that's been published by Holden et al. shows that there is a lower translocation rate with lateral wall placement, just because the electrode can um, simply follow the cochlear duct. Those differences were 7% versus 43%. And then there's a decreased tip foldover rate with lateral wall arrays too, which both are small, but 0.2% versus 1.7%. So I thought this is a very neat picture. This is from one of the cryohistology papers, and it just shows us on um, human and the lateral wall placement is along the cochlear duct versus the more central um, location next to the medallis with the perimedialar placement. Um, same here, we can see that on x-rays, we see the central versus the lateral position. That being said, some studies have shown showed us that with a more focused stimulation of perimedialar electrodes, we do see improved performance. And this was looking at CNC scores at six months. The difference was 55% in the perimedialar versus 41% in the lateral arrays. That being said, um, these numbers are somewhat contradictory to you, and it depends on which results you looked at. This was another study by Javert et al. And they looked at more extensive data. So they didn't stop at the six month. They looked all the way out to two years. So the graph here on the x-axis shows us time from implantation. And on the y-axis, we see the CNC outcomes. And we see with the asterisks here, there was a statistically significant difference at six months. But the performance scores for the lateral wall electrodes caught up at 12 months and 24 months. So similarly, as we've seen with different insertion techniques, potentially the outcomes are more variable or they end up being similar long term. So again, it depends on what the situation is. Are there any underlying conditions that would make you pick uh, perimedialar versus a lateral wall electrode? And I think that all need to be considered when picking an electrode for each patient. Um, that being said, um, Snell et al., this is the meta-analysis I showed you guys earlier for the different insertion techniques, also looked at hearing preservation, looking at lateral wall versus perimedialar um, electrodes. And so 
again, this is a 26 article meta-analysis. And when they started looking at the estimated mean difference, in hearing preservation outcomes between lateral wall and perimedallar electrodes in favor of the straight or the lateral wall electrode. Difference was 24% at one month, but only 1.2% at six months. And there was insufficient data at 12 months. So similar to what we see that previous seen in that previous study, the difference was only there um, early on after implantation, but um, that statistically significant difference went away over time. So now that we understand some of the basics of cochlear implants and the different techniques, let's look at what we know now. And this is again a quote from that same audiology article, and this is what they were able to say about cochlear implantation in current times. So CI users outperform many successful hearing aid users with less severe hearing loss. So Clearly, we've made a lot of progress from the initial implants, which were just giving us sound awareness. So when I started to look for um, good tools to look at, when is it a good time to start to talking to a patient about cochlear implants? This was one of the first hits on Google. This is actually a website from New Zealand that they use from primary care physicians to look at indications for cochlear implant. And instead of looking for numbers on an audiogram, this diagram is actually very simple. And I think it's very useful to kind of keep in mind as we talk to some of our hearing aid users. So the questions they would ask are, do you often ask people to repeat themselves even in a quiet room? Do you avoid social activities because you may not follow what is being said? Is it hard for you to talk on the phone so you avoid using it? And four, are you tired at the end of the day because listening takes so much concentration? So I think these are common day scenarios that, you know, perhaps hearing aid users don't realize they're struggling with their hearing aids, but when they start to think about these scenarios, this is perhaps a good segue to start talking about, is it time to upgrade your hearing aid to a cochlear implant? That being said, uh, from uh, 1984 and 87 when FDA first approved cochlear implants, the indications for implantation have expanded quite a bit. Um, here in one, we see kind of the traditional cochlear implant candidate with the audio shown here in yellow with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss, and this is usually bilateral, versus two, we see the combination for hybrid hearing cases where there is mild to mild moderate low frequency hearing loss with sloping to severe to profound hearing loss in higher frequencies. And then number three, those case by case scenarios like single sided deafness, patients that undergo acoustic neuroma surgery or patients with tinnitus. Uh, for the second half of the presentation here, I'll focus just on group one, the traditional CI candidates, and we'll talk about those specifically. So that being said, um, Insurance to insurance uh, vary slightly about what they use for guidelines for implantation, but I think most of them follow relatively closely uh, to the CMC guidelines or the, to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So for those for conventional cochlear implants, the guidelines are bilateral, moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss in patients but limited benefit from conventional hearing aids. Two, less than 40% open set sentence scores on tape recorded tests in best aided condition. And notice how vague the wording of this sentence is. And we're going to dissect this a little more in the upcoming slides. And three, cognitive ability to use auditory clues and a willingness to undergo extensive program of rehabilitation. And I think this is something to keep in mind too, because some patients might they're immediately gonna turn on their implant and get ideal benefits, which we will see is not necessarily true. So um, when we look at that bullet point too, it's open sentence speech. And as we start having better and better performance from our cochlear implants, the testing conditions and the testing material we use has changed over time. And for us as surgeons, I think it's important to know kind of what these differences are and what are the best way to test our patients so that we can 
try to optimize their performance. So over the years, the change in speech perception testing has usually changed from presentation level, uh, which was initially at 70 down to 60. And we've mostly converted from hint uh, sentence testing to AZ bio sentences. Because um, up to 28% of candidates could read reach 100% score on hint testing, which this is only down to 0.7% with AZ bio testing. Uh, that being said, for some of the patients now, noise is being used to help them qualify if they perform too well in quiet. If they're over that 40% threshold, you can add testing and noise either plus 10 or plus 5 dB to help them qualify for an implant. So that being said, um, here is a little more detail looking at the various testing material. And I think it's interesting to see the difference between how simplistic the hint sentences are compared to the AZ bio sentences. So the AZ bio sentences were created at ASU and they actually interestingly used a five channel cochlear implant simulation to estimate the intelligibility of individual sentences. Um, these were then um, validated. Now there's about 32 sets that are commonly used for testing. In the chart here on the right, we see the different criteria from different manufacturers, which range differently, but essentially the, the idea and the consensus is about the same. You need um, hearing loss, which is defined as severe to profound, to profound, and you need speech perception anywhere from 50 to 60%. Um, so that being said, this is data from, from Dr. Buckman from WashU. Uh, Regardless of this, we do know that um, there are pretty significant differences in performance, regardless of what you use for um, pre-op qualifications. So we do know that most patients are gonna get better within three months after implantation. And usually they reach a performance plateau at around six months, as we see on the graph here. That being said, um, they looked at approximately 100 patients and they divided them into six groups based on performance. And we see that some individuals performed as low as and some performed as high as 90 to 100 percent. So uh, there are multiple factors that we will dive into which potentially affect this performance. Before we do that, um, I think this statement down here at the bottom is very important, and it's just what we can tell patients at how they're going to do overall. And again, this is from Dr. Buckman's paper. Um, he says for patients that qualify in quiet, about 93% will do better. For those patients that qualify in plus 10, um, only about three quarters are going to do better. And for those patients that qualify in plus five, only about 50% or half of them will do better. So I think this is a word of caution when you start talking to your CI audiologist. Essentially with enough noise, all of us could be cochlear implant candidates. And clearly we wouldn't do as well as those that qualified in quiet. So I think um, when you start your practice too, it's important to have a discussion with your CI audiologist to know what your specific qualifying criteria will be, because as we saw in that uh, CMS statement, it's best aided condition, but it doesn't qualify if it's best aided condition and noise or what the specifications are. So now that we start talking about that variability that we saw in the graph there, we don't really know which patients will do better after implantation. There was a recent meta-analysis by Zhao et al. that was in, J in JAMA that looked at various factors and looked at the correlation factors here. So they found association between post-op CI speech perception and age of implantation, duration of hearing loss and hearing aid use, pre-implant pure tone averages, pre-operative aided word scores, cognitive abilities, and etiology of hearing loss. So I think it's important to look at these in some more detail. So uh, the one that I particularly found interesting was the age at implantation. And this is something that we've looked at our house cohort too. 
So prior data that's out there looking specifically at our elderly and geriatric pet um, population are by Dr. Leonard et al. And he looked at cochlear implant performance in different age groups uh, with one of the subset group four being um, the 70 plus year olds. He had a total of 100 and 30 participants with about 20 of them being older than 70. We see some of the outcomes down here in the graphs where on the x-axis we have time from implantation where he went up to two years and on the y-axis we see performance. So um, we did see similar learning to younger adults in the first two years after implantation. So there really wasn't much difference in that aspect. Similarly, when we were looking at just performance in quiet, the speech perception showed no difference between performance in the geriatric patients compared to the younger patients. Um, the, where the difference came into play was actually in testing and noise, where the performance of the geriatric group was significantly lower than that of the younger patients. We here on the graphs see that group four is lagging behind the other three groups pretty significantly. And this is something that did not catch up over over time. So we do know that the elderly, based on this study, at least in loud environments, do not do as well as the younger patients. That being said, uh, Joling et al. has looked at longer term data and uh, speech perception in elderly patients with cochlear implants up to four to five years. So they looked at 20 elderly patients with cochlear implants and compared it to 37 controls. The mean follow up was 4.4 years and five. 0.3 years respectively. And again, similar to what Leonard's et al. have found, they found no, no significant differences in average speech discrimination between the two groups. They only did testing in quiet, so it would be curious to see how this potentially would differ in noise. They also found a larger intrasubject variability in the elderly patients where there was not a consistent performance and perhaps there are other factors that come into play as well. And then they did not see any significant changes over time. And we see this kind of nicely graphed in the table here from their data, where on the x-axis we have time from implantation, E is the elderly group and C is the control. And on the y-axis we see their performance scores. So we do see that the elderly overall are much more varied or they're more all over the place. We do see that they're somewhat lower on the y-axis or on the performance scores and their mean is a little lower with the gray line too. But again, this did not reach statistical significance. So I think as we counsel our patients, even the elderly can have quite a bit of benefit from cochlear implants. That being said, we looked at our own cohort here at the house clinic. And with that being said, we perform a retrospective chart review. Our current um, electronic medical records go back to June of 2013. So we look from the start of electronic records to January 2021, where the data was pulled. Uh, we specifically looked for patients that were older than 80 and who had a procedure code for cochlear implant. Um, initially, we identified 189 patients, and then we screened these patients to make sure that they had a follow-up for at least 12 months, and then they had complete audiometric data with um, CI follow-up. And for that, we got a total of 102 patients. The mean age was 84.8 years, and curiously, the oldest patient that was implanted was actually 94 years old. We had a total of 36 females and 66 males. The mean length of hearing loss was about 25 years and about three quarters of our cohort had consistently used binaural amplification in the year leading up to implantation. The mean BMI for our cohort was 26. Um, that being said, uh, we implant all three main manufacturers. So 69 had cochlear, 18 had AB, and 14 had Medel. And here in this table is just a summary of pre-op and post-op scores. As expected, everyone did better with their implant. And these are post-op scores that we looked at at six months. So we see the AZ biosentences scores in quiet went from 12% to 53%. Um, AZ biosentences is in plus 10 dB went from 10 to 59, and CNC word scores improved from 10 to 40. So clearly all of these were statistically significant, and the post-op scores are similar or slightly lower than what's being published right now for the general population. 
That being said, uh, what I was specifically interested in was to see if there are any correlations between age of implantation and overall performance as measured by AZ biosentences and CNC scores. So we did a Spearman rank order correlation. And even though we saw a negative correlation both between age and AZ bio scores and CNC scores, neither of these reached statistical significance. So essentially, even though the elderly might do slightly worse, there is no um, obvious trend that they're not going to do as well. So I don't think age should be a counterindication or a discouraging number for anyone to get a cochlear implant if they're healthy enough. That being said, I think especially in the elderly, it's important to take a look at the overall picture and not just the audiometric outcomes. So just very quick taking a sidestep here and looking at some of the balance testing. So for all of our patients over 65, we routinely perform a pre-op BNG. And so that includes a bithermal calorics, gaze testing, and we define unilateral weakness with scores than less than 20%. So out of our elderly cohort, 61 had normal function, 22 had ipsilateral weakness, seven had contralateral weakness, and eight had bilateral hypofunction. Despite these larger numbers, only 13 patients noted preoperative balance problems. That number increased to 30 immediately um, postoperatively with patients reporting imbalance, but for most of these, this has um, improved over time in their subsequent visits. Um, this is something that's been previously looked at at Wong et al. They've looked at a slightly younger population. They looked at patients that were older than 75. And similar to our numbers, they found 20% of their patients had unilateral pre-op weakness. But at least they concluded, and we drew a similar conclusion as well, is that the benefit of improved speech perception after cochlear implants is significant and post-operative complications, including disequilibrium, should not be a major limitation when um, advising the elderly regarding implants. They also made a point to potentially consider uh, physical therapy and vestibular rehab early on in the recovery period. So that's something to keep in mind. So um, when we go back to this main uh, list of factors affecting CI performance, we did a deep dive into the age of implantation. The next bullet point that was of interest to me was the cognitive abilities and brain plasticity. So um, we know that Dr. Franklin has uh, previously published on this pretty extensively, and we know that there's a good link between hearing loss and cognitive decline. Two studies of his that I want to point out to you guys are a publication from 2013, which is where this graph on the right comes from. And he looked at over 1,100 individuals with at least baseline hearing, so anywhere from mild to profound hearing loss. And he looked at two measuring scores, both the global function as measured by 3MS, which is in the graph here, and also the executive function as measured by the digital symbol substitution. And the annual rates of decline for both of these compared to uh, normally hearing controls were 41% and 32% greater. So hearing loss was linked to much higher rates of cognitive decline, as we see on the graph here, where the solid line is hearing loss and the rate is much steeper than the normal hearing individuals. Um, Dr. Lin has also looked at what this means as far as brain volumes. So in 2014, he performed a study looking at 51 individuals with hearing impairment and compared them to 75 individuals with normal hearing. And they looked at both whole brain volumes and regional volumes within the right temporal lobe. And they saw a statistically higher decrease in volumes of individuals with hearing loss. So again, it's not only a functional decline, but it's actually a physical decline that can be seen on imaging as well. So now that we know that there is that significant correlation, what about hearing rehabilitation and cognitive decline? This is something that's still being studied pretty extensively. And the two papers I showed you show here, the top one is from Italy, the bottom one is from Germany. And essentially by Castellon et al, they looked at 125 patients and they looked at hearing rehabilitation either by unilateral or bilateral hearing aids or a cochlear implant. 
plan. And regardless of the hearing rehabilitation, all of these groups demonstrated significant improvement in hearing, in memory task, and in levels of depression after hearing rehabilitation. Similarly, Walter et al. has actually looked at 60 subjects who had received implants. And even at six months, they did see improvement to speech perception, quality of life, and neurocognitive ability. So similar to what we kind of see with those plateau graphs from Dr. Buckman. In contrast, actually for long-term memory, it took up to a year to see benefits. So um, there are some short-term and some longer-term effects with hearing rehabilitation. So that being said, um, we similarly looked at cognitive abilities and CI performance within our house cohort as well. So we used that same set of patients, 102 patients, and um, we looked specifically at a subset of patients that had a diagnosis of cognitive decline or dementia. This was labeled by their primary care physicians during their pre-op testing, or it was specifically mentioned during their HPI with the audiologist or the um, surgeon. And so we ended up having 23 patients with this diagnosis, and we compared them to age match controls. We looked at their performance six, six months after um, activation of their device. And so interestingly, we saw a statistically significant difference in their AZ bio scores. We saw that they were performing worse than their age match control. So 34% versus 55%. We see that here in the graph on the right. And similarly with CNC word score, that this did not reach statistical significance, but it was right there with a P of 0 0.06. There was very limited data for bimodal conditions, so but overall there was no difference. So it's interesting. These patients clearly still do a lot better than they would preoperatively, and clearly cochlear implants help them quite a bit, but the outcomes are not as high as in their um, non cognitive or non-dementia uh, patients. So that being said, I think for some of these patients that come with their caregivers, we just have to have realistic expectations and perhaps some of those percentages that we quote as improvement are not as high for these specific subset. Um, that being said, in the last couple minutes here, I want to show you one last thing that I worked with um, with Dr. Mill, and this is a newer concept for cochlear implants, and it's something that's called uh, data logging. So essentially, all three of the main manufacturers now include that, this, and this is something that you can download during the cochlear implant interrogation, and it not only tells you how long each day the device is being used on average. It also gives you different scenarios in which the device is being used. And if there are multiple programs, then they show you the program. So this is an example of how that interrogation looks from one of the patients that was used in our cohort. That being said, data logging is something that's being looked at. And there's been a few publications that have recorded out so far, so Holder et al. has looked at 300 patients, mean age for them was 64, and they found that on average, people use their device for about 10 hours. And interestingly, they found a strong significant correlation between hours of processor use and their performance as measured by CNC and AZ bio sentences. Um, similarly, Schwartz and Lazak have looked at um, different age groups with that having a small subpopulation of people older than 80. And with those, they actually had decreased daily use at 10.9 hours compared to the younger adults who were using their device for 13 hours. Similar to Holder et al., they did show that the average number of use correlated with post-op audiometric outcomes, including CNC scores. So we did a similar analysis with our very elderly cohort. So these are all individuals that are 80 plus years old. On the pie chart here, we see the distribution of in what conditions they use their devices. So um, more than half the time they're using their device in quiet, the next subset is in speech and then speech and noise. Um, similar to the numbers we saw published by Holder et al., the mean processor use for us was also 10 hours, 
And similarly, even in these very elderly patients, we saw a positive correlation between daily use and the CNC outcomes. And this was also seen in AZ bio outcomes. So a word of caution here is this is correlation, not causation. So we can say that if you were your implant longer, you're gonna do better. Potentially it's because these patients perform better, they choose to wear their implant longer. So it, it's hard to know what this means, but I think it's interesting data to potentially share with our patients, especially some of those that are struggling with using their device, because perhaps if they do use it more consistently, some of those outcomes could be a little better. Um, so that being said, we're wrapping up here, but I wanted to point out that, you know, we keep looking at numbers and we keep looking at how well did they perform, how good of a hearing preservation did we have in those cases, or how well overall performance do they have, whether it's AZ bio, whether it's CNC scores, whether it's cognition, but I think kind of a more holistic picture or a more overall picture to look at is the quality of life scale. Because I would say some patients who do not have performance scores as high as we would potentially want them to have still have significant benefits from their cochlear implant. So there are different quality of life scales that have been validated. The first one is from Germany, the second one is from France, and the last one here is from Dr. McCracken, cochlear implant quality of life 35 profile. And I would say, as we look at our data, it's an important factor to keep in mind and potentially um, talk to patients about, even though you're not doing as well as you expect to, you're still doing a lot better and your overall quality of life is a lot better. So that being said, I'd like to thank the house team and Dr. Mills and Dr. Miller who helped me with these data sets. Um, here are my references and I'm happy to take any questions. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.